and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host. science behind astrology it's more than what the future is all about it's time for a visit with andrea gertz astrological detective get ready for a unique ride now here's andrea gertz as a consulting astrologer of more than 17 years i have read a great number of astrological books at a certain point in my career i took an interest in the ancient philosophies of our craft a voracious curiosity led me to texts written 2000 years ago over the years of studying these old astrology books, my worldview has evolved greatly. I distinctly remember a time when I knew I had reached a plateau in learning. I wanted to truly comprehend traditional astrology texts, yet I felt blocked. It seemed that there was some concept or perspective I was missing. In order to learn more about ancient Greek thought, I attended a History of Science convention in San Diego. Seeking to explore the philosophies of Plato, I picked a few talks on teleology. Throughout the weekend, I absorbed the teleological worldview. As the concepts of teleology soaked in, everything clicked. Several light bulbs went on. Since the day I arrived home from that conference, I've been greatly inspired by integrating the teleological worldview into my astrological practice. In this article, I attempt to share this concept with the modern working astrologer. Let's start with a basic definition of teleology as taken right from the dictionary. Teleology. 1. The study of evidence of design in nature. 2. A doctrine explaining phenomena by final causes. 3. The natural process of being directed towards an end or shaped by a purpose. Now, we can notice right away, as keen watchers of the planetary clock, that tracking nature's design through celestial transitions, astrologers are teleologists. We are seeking to understand the larger, grand design through the nature of the heavens. Now, let's look to the second definition, a doctrine explaining phenomena by final causes. First we must ask, what is a final cause? Again, let's start with the dictionary definition. A final cause is the purpose, end, aim, or goal of something. The final cause of a creation could be described as its purpose, its function. Each person, animal, or thing can be described in terms of its final cause. Simply put, a creation can be understood in terms of life purpose. When something has reached its final cause, it has been molded into itself, in its own end product. It has produced the fruits of its vine. Let's dive further into teleology through its root word. Telos. A telos can be defined as a creature, plant, or object that has fulfilled its unique, complete, and perfect form. A telos is actually the end product of the life. For instance, a perfectly ripe apple could be understood as having been pulled towards its final cause or purpose, which is to become an apple. When it has reached the acme of its existence, it will have manifested its apple end product, or an apple telos. Teleology, then, could be described as a study and explanation of things unfolding into their end product. We can now move to the concept of telos as a practicing astrologer, Vettius Valens, used, used it 2,000 years ago. In the sixth book of his anthology, Valens writes, The moon races through the stars, walking on the planets and flowing away from them. As she does so, she carries the winds, creating eclipses, shadows, and other phenomena. These moments sync up earth, sea, and heavens. The racing of the moon and her combination with the remaining stars are the origin of every telos created. It is interesting to notice that nearly all ancient astrologers were working from a teleological worldview. 
Our predecessors hardly understood that the end product of life, or telos, is influenced by the weathers of the birth moment. Ancient astrologers were working under the assumption that the natal chart reflects potentials for temperament, expression, life purpose, vocation, and more, all contributing to the end, end product or final cause. Our predecessors affectionately called the birth and birth chart an apotelosmatograph, which is a graph of all matters pertaining to the full manifestation of the end product that shall come to pass. Is the natal chart and what does it indicate exactly? Now, imagine going to the store to buy a pack of seeds. Each seed pack is decorated with an image of what can be grown with the seeds inside. This is what the natal chart indicates. The potential fruits of the vine, the life purpose and heart of creation. As teleologists drawing up a chart, we can ask, what are the preordained potentials in this chart? What will grow here? What is the final cause, purpose, and end product of this life? We can examine physical potentials through astrophysiognomy. What will this body look like? Will it be earth, earthy and dense, or muscular and sinewy? Will it develop into a chubby Italian cook or a lithe Olympic athlete? Will the face be ch chiseled and square or round and cherub-like? Will the body be tall or short? We can also look into potentials of temperament. What traits will mark the personality? Will the character be sweet or acerbic? Fiery or melancholic? Bitter or mild-mannered? Funny? What is the communication style? We can assess the potentials in terms of life tasks. What might a dense, earthy person enjoy doing with their day? What occupation would suit a toned, muscular type? Would an acerbic, bitter person enjoy working as a security guard? Could this seed grow a baker, a police officer, a salesperson? There are a number of methods for extracting information about potentials and life tasks. Let's look to a few factors considered by past authors. What criteria did traditional authors use to assess potentials? 1. Nocturnal and diurnal classification also called sun. Now, the sun and the moon were very important in assessing natural potentials and life purpose. The sun was said to indicate potential for the life praxis. That's the practical and business-oriented tasks. The moon was thought to influence nourishment potential. A simple way that planetary classification was thought to affect potential is that a person born during the day would be more inclined towards practical affairs than nourishing tasks. Conversely, an individual born at night might gravitate towards moon tasks, caretaking, nurturing, and so on. Next, we have the elemental triangles. The four elements were also used by traditional astrologers to assess the fruits of the vine. The four elements affect the end product entirely. Not only do the elements shape physical expression, they also influence temperament. For instance, a person born with a majority of planets in Earth signs holds a potential for a thick and dense body. The temperament has potential to be practical, concrete, and pragmatic. If a cluster of planets is found in air signs, the physical body is more likely to be long, thin, and lanky. The personality will be chatty, cerebral, and full of fresh air. Someone with a chart dominant in water signs is more fleshy and emotional. A fire chart holds potential for a muscular body and fiery temperament. Another is planetary aspects. Now the angles between planets also have a great effect on potential. Traditional astrologers believe that angles from Mars or Saturn to a planet will harshen the expression of that planet. Mars in a hard aspect to a planet was thought to bring contention and fights, marring the pure expression of the other planet. Saturn was thought to suppress the end product of other planets through limitation, oppositional circumstances, and so on. Venus and Jupiter conversely magnify the expression of the other planets. When examining prominence, we are asking questions such as, 
How notable will this, will this life be? Will this person stand out? Do they have potential to be a thoroughbred? In matters of prominence, traditional astrologers analyze the fortitude of the natal chart. Possibilities and limits become clear through tests of planetary strength. An assessment of a planet's essential dignity can illustrate the strength of its essence. If a planet is dignified, the potential to manifest increases. For instance, if Mars is found in one of its own signs, it will be strengthened. What traditional astrologers understood is that a strong Mars increases the potential for martial characteristics to manifest in the life end product, in the essence, personality, temperament, physical form, occupation, and more. If Mars is weak in the natal chart, the potential for martial expression is limited. From this viewpoint, a strong Venus will pr produce distinct Venusian traits. A weak Venus will produce few Venusian qualities. This is true of the remaining planets as well. In his introduction to the Tetrabiblos, Neoplatonic philosopher Porphyry of Tyre describes essential dignity from a teleological perspective. He includes several indications that the proposed outcomes of the planets will come to pass. Here are a few standard checks of planetary strength noted in his list. Number one, a planet will manifest its end product when in a good place from the ascendant. This is an angular house or one that can be seen by the ascendant. That means houses one, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten, and eleven. Understand houses 2, 6, 8, and 12 are not visible from the first house, from an optical perspective. Those are blind spots. Number two, a planet will produce what is promised when it's in one of its own places. That means its own sign, element, exaltation, or bounds. Number three, a planet will manifest its essential nature when moving direct. That means it's not retrograde at birth. Number four, a planet will be highly expressed when it is not conjunct, square, or opposed by a malefic. Number five, a planet will produce what it's promised when making an aspect to a benefic. Once we have gained a clear picture of potentials, as well as the limits of expression, we can turn to a creature's unfolding. Traditional astrologers propose that the natal chart unfolds along with the heavens. Specifically, they suggest that we are pulled to growth by heartfelt longings incited by planetary transits. The growth process from a teleological astrologer's worldview is rather simple. Step one, enjoy a new heartfelt longing incited by a planetary transit. Step two, grasp outwards towards your heartfelt longing. Be pulled further into growth. Step three, bear beautiful and bountiful fruits. From the lens of the traditional astrologer, it's a person's choice to practice and train for their special life task. Porphyry says, it will be necessary to cultivate excellence in craftsmanship so that a soul might flourish in its works. Various treasures are waiting to be manifested by any man or woman. There are certain habits we might engage to exercise and train the body for its specialized skill set. If we are to train for our unique purpose, the task for which we have been made, we will experience fruitfulness and fertility. In conclusion, having taken in these ideas from our ancestors, we may want to integrate the teleological worldview into our work. We can support clients by illuminating, illuminating their various potentials. We can enhance meaning by discussing the fruits of the vine, taking an interest in their life's work. We can propose that each of us has come here for a special life task granted by our very own spirit, breathed into us during gestation and birth. Whether the life purpose is to be a magician or a housewife, we can support clients as they are growing. We can convey that each moment brings us closer to who we have been designed to become, celebrating during fruitful weathers and encouraging through the droughts. We can aid clients in understanding how to best express the outside influences, working towards temperance and grace through the various twists and turns of growth. As catalysts to hardy evolution, we can provide encouragement year after year, 
offering advice, referrals, book recommendations, and remedies, all meant to extract and cultivate that which has been set in motion to manifest naturally. <laughs>